Hello, hello everyone. Good evening. Thank you all for being here with us tonight. As always, I hope you and your loved ones are safe and well. Tonight, I would like to welcome you all to our first Congressional Coffee and Kulan discussion. For those who don't know what Kulan means, it translates to meeting in Somali. And this is the first of many Coffee and Kulan discussions we will be having on a variety of topics and issues. This evening, we will discuss cannabis legalization. Support for legalization has been increasing in recent years. Cannabis is now legalized in 15 states and accessible for medical use in 36. In, it is time we universally pass legislation that allows recreational use of cannabis for adults only. Sponges pass charges and regulates the sale of cannabis, but it's still not fully legal in Minnesota. Tonight, I'm honored to be joined by my colleague and the original progressive OG, Representative Barb Lee from California's 13th Congressional District. She has been a fierce advocate and champion for legalization at a federal level and I'm so grateful for her presence here with us tonight. And Minnesota's majority leader, Ryan Winkler. He represents District 46A here in Minnesota. He is leading legislation at the Minnesota Capitol to legalize and will be giving us a state level perspective on this issue. We will discuss bills that have been introduced on both federal and state levels of government, the significance and need to address this issue and the overall impact legalizing would have on our country. Now I would like to introduce, I would like to have my guests introduce themselves and we will start with Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congresswoman Omar, for inviting me to be with you once again, virtually, even though I can remember visiting your district and having such a remarkable moment a few years ago. And I just want to uh, thank your constituents, first of all, for uh, making sure that you continue to be reelected to Congress because your voice, the voices of your constituents, uh, what you bring to the House of Representatives no one else has brought. And I just want to thank you so much for expanding, you know, our work, our vision and, and our uh, agenda uh, in a very bold way. So it's, it's good to be with you once again with, with your folks at home. So let me just say a couple of things now on um, cannabis reform. I, um, for many years, worked for a great leader who uh, passed away a couple of years ago, Congressman Ron Dellums. And that this was in the 70s and 80s. And during that time, um, we worked with a variety of organizations because we saw what was coming and we saw the disparities and we saw the racial equity issue uh, in uh, the marijuana laws, the war on drugs with Ronald Reagan. We knew what was taking place then. And so we worked with a variety of organizations then to try to begin to uh, deschedule and um, legalize marijuana at the uh, federal level. So for me, this is almost a lifelong <laughs> struggle and, and fight. And finally, um, I'm able now to serve as the co-chair of the Cannabis Caucus, which is bipartisan in the House of Representatives. So we do have Republicans and Democrats who work on uh, cannabis legislation. What, uh, let me just mention a couple of facts. Uh, according to ACLU, for example, and why this is so important in terms of racial justice, Black Americans are nearly four times more likely to be arrested for cannabis-related crimes than white Americans. Black and brown people are targeted more frequently than white Americans despite equal rates of use. Additionally, prison sentences for black and brown people are more likely and more they're more likely and also lengthier than white people. Black men receive sentences over 13% longer than white men. And nearly 80% of people in federal prison for drug offenses are African-American, Black, or Latino. So this is serious. I mean, and this is all a part of the war on drugs. And this is the, the I say, some say the unintended consequence, but I say it's the intended consequence 
in America. And it's part of uh, the structural racism that's uh, part of the DNA of America. And so this past uh, November, we saw five different states pass cannabis measures uh, for adult use or medicinal cannabis. We saw Arizona, Montana, New Jersey, Mississippi, and South Dakota. So now 36 states have legalized medic medicinal cannabis and 15 have legalized adult use cannabis. Last December, we passed the Marijuana Opportunity and Reinvestment and Expungement Act of, well, 2020. It's called the Moore Act, and we're going to reintroduce it again. But this is a real breakthrough because we got it off of the floor. And uh, people want cannabis reform, and it's time now that Congress catches up. And so just briefly in the Moore Act, it included, and I actually, I'm so proud of the fact I introduced the very first cannabis reform bill called the Marijuana Justice Act. So the Marijuana Justice Act, what it did was expunge all the records of those convicted of drug offenses, provide for um, descheduling, of course, and provide for a restorative justice fund because we know that so many people, uh, their lives have been shattered as a result of these unjust laws. So we have to help build a fund so that people can move on with their lives with job training, business opportunities, or whatever they so desire. And finally, uh, we put in uh, the bill, my um, Respect Act, which is about equity in the business. We know that less than 1% of the licenses are granted to people of color. And it's a billion dollar business. And so if, if states are gonna pass these laws, if we're going to and we will deschedule, then these business opportunities create tax revenue and jobs, good paying jobs for our communities. And so the MORE Act encompasses all of that. And I had what we called, uh, well, some people call it the Reaper Act. Uh, I called it the Refer Act. It just depends on, you know, <laughs> what, how you want to call it. But what it did was deny, I'm on the Appropriations Committee. So we would not fund any agency that goes into the states and bamps on marijuana uh, disp uh, dispensaries or producers if the states have actually passed their uh, laws. And so we would not allow federal funding to any entity that would do that. So I'll just stop now and just say thank you so much for having me with you. It's really wonderful to be here. I'm glad that Minnesota is, is moving ahead. And I look forward to hearing Representative Winkler and know what you're doing there. Thank you again. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Congresswoman. Uh, and we are delighted to have you uh, as an appropriator. Um, now I will let uh, Representative Ryan Winkler introduce himself. Uh, good evening. Thank you so much, Ilhan, for having this forum and for introducing me remotely to Congresswoman Lee. It's a real honor to be in the same Zoom with you, Congresswoman. And I want to say at the beginning that everything that you just talked about as goals for cannabis reform, cannabis legalization, are exactly the same goals that we have here in Minnesota. We know, for example, we know at the outset that there are some harms associated with cannabis. Kids and youth access is not a good thing. There are certain uh, psychological conditions that cannabis can exacerbate and create problems. But the harms that cannabis creates are far outweighed by the criminal prohibition of cannabis that we have today. And I fully agree with you that our laws are working exactly as they were intended to work. They were intended to criminalize people based on their uh, skin color. They were based on their race. They were intended to criminalize people based on where they lived and to create tools for law enforcement to unfairly apply the law. So we know that that harm has been going on for decades. And at the heart of our bill in Minnesota is a desire to right past wrongs, to legalize, to expunge criminal records, and to deliberately create opportunities for people in communities hardest hit by the war on drugs to be involved in the business, to uh, have opportunities to participate uh, in the workforce, and to make sure that those communities actually benefit from the revenue raised from cannabis. And so uh, we think that the bill in Minnesota has uh, all the elements in place that you just described from your decades of work in Washington, and we intend to bring that bill forward. In fact, our first committee hearing for our full legalization bill is tomorrow in the Minnesota House, and we intend to bring that bill all the way through and pass it. We didn't do it quite as quickly as the U.S. House did in December, uh, but um, we do intend to bring it all the way through, and we think it will set a standard for equity, for righting past wrongs and addressing the uh, racist war on crime, 
to create a Minnesota-based uh, business for small business, micro business, and craft type businesses. Uh, we will allow Minnesotans to have the basic freedom to safely use a product uh, that they will enjoy both for its health benefits and for its personal use. And we will make sure that those who do get health benefits have a product that is affordable and, and they know what they're getting. So uh, it's time to end uh, this past uh, approach. It is time, long past time to make cannabis legal in Minnesota and to begin dismantling the structural criminal justice attack on uh, black and brown Minnesotans, uh, black and brown Americans, and we can do it with this bill and we're gonna push hard and I'm excited to be here with you to talk about it. Yeah, thank you, Representative Winkler. Um, and I'm I'm just excited for us to have uh, this discussion. Um, but first, before we dive into um, it, I would like for us to play a short video uh, to help set the stage for the discussion that we will engage in. In 2020, there was one issue both Republicans and Democrats could agree on. An overwhelming majority of voters said yes to the legalization of marijuana. Montana voters gave their clear backing to marijuana. Arizona, South Dakota. You can say a lot of uh, New Jersey voters are high tonight. New Jersey arrests around 30,000 people a year for marijuana possession, more than almost any other state. But this year, they voted to legalize marijuana. Arizona voted to legalize it, too. So did Montana. So did South Dakota. Medical marijuana was passed in Mississippi. Now one in three Americans live in a state where access to marijuana has been legalized. Oregon took it even further and decriminalized possession of all drugs on Election Day. Over decades, America's war on drugs has put millions of people in prison. And today, it's widely understood to have disproportionately affected people of color. For example, black Americans use marijuana at the same rates as white Americans, but are arrested for it at a much higher rate. This map shows that more and more Americans are starting to turn against the country's harsh drug laws, but ending them entirely will be a lot more complicated. Wow, that was great. Um, Ryan, Representative Winkler, um, could you tell us about your, um, just more details about your uh, cannabis bill here in, in Minnesota and, um, and, and the process of uh, trying to pass it um, in the Minnesota House? Yeah, so, so we create uh, what we call a cannabis management board, which is a separate state board that will be responsible for distributing licenses for people getting involved in the business. So on the marketplace side, we create a board that creates a set of regulations. We don't allow any local uh, jurisdictions to opt out uh, because our main goal is to shift an illegal marketplace into a legal marketplace. It's no surprise that there is a robust cannabis marketplace in every state, including in Minnesota. And uh, something like 680,000 Minnesotans, uh, which is over 10% of our population try cannabis on an annual basis. So there's a robust marketplace. What we're trying to do is create a shift so that people have every reason to go and purchase cannabis through the legal market. That means we don't want our tax rates to be too high. We don't want regulatory burdens to be too difficult. We want to create an active uh, and strong marketplace so that we shift it over. That means that we will then know where cannabis is in our communities. We will know uh, if kids have it, where they might be able to get it or how to limit it. Uh, and customers, consumers will know what they're buying. So first of all, we're trying to create a robust marketplace with lots of players. Uh, we, we prevent vertical integration, which means that one big cannabis company can't own a whole supply chain all the way through and dominate the marketplace. We limit it so that people have to either be uh, growers, manufacturers, distributors, or retailers, and we separate them out and we require them to be Minnesota owned. So we're really trying, we've listened to a lot of people about the, the desire for a homegrown uh, economy in cannabis, and that's what we're trying to do. We're also using resources that we raise through taxes uh, on cannabis to help grant making, training, and other kinds of programs to allow it to be easier for people in under uh, uh, served and impoverished communities to get access into a business because access to capital is a challenge. Um, and so the whole robust 
kind of system of marketplace development that we have is really geared towards making it not only uh, a marketplace that Minnesotans can trust, but a marketplace that benefits Minnesotans, especially those Minnesotans who have been most adversely affected by the war on drugs. Um, and that's based on uh, extensive public hearings we've had around the state. Uh, that is a common refrain everywhere we go, uh, that that's the kind of uh, marketplace that we want to create. I can get into lots of details. Uh, we expunge criminal records uh, automatically uh, up to a certain level and create a special expungement board to quickly review those records of people who have higher level offenses. Um, uh, we uh, make have a number of uh, provisions related to energy use and conservation so that we are not expending huge amounts of energy in this industry uh, and, and really are looking at making this an equitable marketplace, eliminating the past wrongs and creating a, 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 a marketplace that really serves the needs of Minnesotans. Thank you. Uh, and Representative Lee, as a um, continuous champion uh, for cannabis legalization, can you um, tell us what the work uh, looks like for you uh, as the co-chair of the Congressional Cannabis Caucus, uh, what the MORE Act actually does, um, and why is it important for us to do this on a federal level? Because I know that Ryan just talked about what they're doing um, in Minnesota, and there's a lot of conversation, obviously, um, where some are saying, you know, we should just let the states do it. What are the benefits to doing this on a federal level? Sure. Thank you. And uh, Representative Winkler, listening to you uh, tells me that Minnesota is learning from the mistakes of those of us who went early. I mean, that's a very progressive bill that you, you're a uh, champion. So I just want to congratulate you for it, uh, especially you talk about the uh, sort of the consolidation of the industry it, uh, where smaller and uh, people of color can't get into the industry. The way you all are doing it will definitely mitigate against that from happening. And so I want to congratulate you on, you. on that. Wow. So on the, the MORE Act, uh, first of all, we actually um, deschedule it uh, from the list of con uh, control substances, which means that uh, it will be legal. Okay, which means going to the second part of your question is that, uh, for instance, in my district in California, uh, the feds would come in and shut dispensaries down because they say they were violating federal law when, in fact, they were not violating state law. And so the federal government could come in and arrest people. And I mean, it, it was it's a total mess uh, even now. And we have lawsuits after lawsuits after lawsuits. So it's important that at the federal level, we uh, deschedule so that uh, those who are in the industry don't have to worry, don't have to fear about uh, being seen as illegal from the feds. So that's very important. Uh, and keeping people out of jail, I mean, because they arrest people, <laughs> unfortunately, for that. We also require uh, in the MORE Act the expungement of all of the uh, past federal cannabis offenses, uh, which means um, your record is clean, which means then you can um, apply for, I mean, you know, up until very recent, you know, if you have a uh, something on your record, you couldn't apply for public housing, SNAP benefits, Pell grants, I mean, public benefits uh, were denied and are denied in many states. Uh, and so we say states can't impose those barriers anymore. Another provision is, well, you can't deny the federal uh, public benefit or any benefit or protection under the immigration laws based on uh, mm -hmm. cannabis or use or past cannabis conviction. And we provide funding to small business uh, cannabis operators who that are owned by socially and disadvantaged individuals. And finally, there's a, a tax um, provision of this. And, and Representative Winkler, you said, uh, you weren't going to do this as fast as the feds as we did it. Look, it took us years to get this passed. <laughs> a, long, a long time. Uh, and this provision, the 5% tax on uh, cannabis to fund community reinvestment grants that support substance abuse treatment and programs and other services. I mean, this tax gave us a little bit of um, grief uh, <laughs> from some. And so it took us a long time to get, get this passed. Now we've got to start all over again. And some of the uh, gaps that were um, seen in the uh, or written or allowed in the initial bill, we're going to fix those and move it forward once again. And hopefully now uh, with 
the Senate and with the White <laughs> House. <laughs> we hope we can get the Moore Act uh, signed into law. Um, Representative Lee, I know you just said uh, it took a long time, uh, and and I and I want you to expand on that a little bit because oftentimes when we see a piece of legislation pass, you know, as as we're currently working on the um, fifteen dollar minimum wage, you know, people are just like, oh, they're doing the minimum wage, and people forget the work <laughs> that went into the decade long fight um, for minimum wage, and cannabis has been more than a decade long fight. Uh, can you expand a little bit about your work uh, in in trying to get the more act passed um, and uh, and how how long you've been involved in in this fight? Well, well, let me just mention the the fight for fifteen first of all, because I have to give credit to your attorney general, uh, Keith Ellison, because I was the former co-chair of the Progressive Caucus, and then Keith uh, took over with Mark, and we started. Keith led on the fight for fifteen. And we were in New York, we were in uh, D.C. and California protesting. I mean, the Progressive Caucus, we were out in the streets fighting for a $15 minimum wage. And so I just have to I, salute I, Keith. I once, I once was at a, at a strike with him in front of McDonald's at 4.30 in the morning. That's so, right. yes. <laughs> yeah. So don't we can't revise history on this. And so I'm yeah. glad you mentioned it, but it was Minnesota, okay? Your attorney general that led the way. <laughs> so here we are now. So on uh, cannabis reform, let me tell you. First of all, we've had a cannabis caucus for probably eight or nine years. Never uh, a person of color, never a woman to co-chair it. So uh, Earl Blumenauer and myself, we conspired uh, because he gets it and he's led on so many issues as it relates to cannabis reform. And this racial justice component of it was so dear to his heart until we figured out that it was about time that a black woman be a co-chair of the Cannabis Caucus with, say, a Don Young out of Alaska, and to bring the Republicans on board to view cannabis reform with an added lens of racial justice. So that goes back years. So I introduced the very first, way before the Moore Act, the, as I said, the Marijuana Justice Act. Gosh, let me see if I have the dates. I don't know, this probably was six years ago, maybe. <laughs> I mean, and that set the stage for the MORE Act because what I just told you and about the MORE Act, those provisions for the most part were in the Marijuana Justice Act. And so I believe it was when um, Jerry Nadler became chair of the Judiciary Committee. It was then that we talked about a broader, more comprehensive bill that included not only my Marijuana Justice Act, but the Reefer Act, the Refer Act, and the Respect Act, and some other provisions also. And so that must have been two, four years ago, I think. <laughs> and so it's, we've been plugging along, building, but we had to build public support also and Republican support. Now we still have, I, I don't remember how many Republicans voted for it, but we got we had quite a few Republicans vote for it when it came uh, when it was on the floor last year. Mm -hmm. And so this took, I would say overall a good um, for me personally, starting with the Marijuana Justice Act, this took at least seven or eight years <laughs> just to get to this point mm -hmm. where we were able to get the Moore Act off of the floor. So you all are doing well. <laughs> I gotta commend you. <laughs> Because this process is one of negotiation. We have to have, and our activists and our wonderful uh, communities have just risen to the occasion. And so I give a lot of credit, uh, Congressman uh, Omar and Representative Winkler, to our young people and to the communities all across the country who have organized, and they're really well organized. We've done panels. We've done marches, rallies. We've done now Zoom calls. We've done hearings. They've come to Capitol Hill to testify. I mean, and so the public support, we had to, you know, we believe, I know Congresswoman Omar and myself believe in inside outside strategy. So we had to work with our outside groups and, and uh, negotiate and navigate and uh, push, push, push. And so that gave us on the inside the ability and, and the confidence and the the backing to move forward with the bills, but it took a heck of a lot. I mean, the public and our communities were so instrumental in getting this passed. Yeah. Um, 
Ryan, you're, you're probably as the um, majority leader aware of this. Uh, in Minnesota, we have one of the worst disparities um, between uh, black people and white people um, of, of any state in the country. And, uh, and I know uh, Congresswoman, you know, in those conversations that we had when you came uh, to visit, um, you got a front row seat um, to, to witnessing uh, some, some of the serious conversations that we're having about racial equity in our state. And I know that um, majority uh, of, of the discussion around um, cannabis has been about uh, how it will address and help reduce some of the racial disparities that, that exist around the country and specifically in, in Minnesota. And I, I wanted you both to, to touch on that. How do you see it impacting um, the, the racial equity um, disparities that exist in our state and across the country? Well, I don't, yeah, I don't want to say that this is going to solve all criminal justice disparities in Minnesota, far from it. Uh, but there is no question that cannabis arrests have led to a lot of other uh, charges. Uh, they, you know, for, you know, searches based on just smelling cannabis, stops based on smelling cannabis, uh, to, um, you know, the terrible situation, killing of Philando Castile, which in part was based on uh, cannabis smell in the car. And that was part of the outrageous justification from the officer for why he was not in a, the right frame of mind in, with respect to that stop. So it can have devastating consequences. And, dis, and that disproportionality um, is throughout the criminal system. I mean, you know, in Minnesota, we were one of the first states to uh, decriminalize a small amount of cannabis, uh, down, you know, an ounce and a half or less. But above that, it is still a felony. And those felony convictions, you know, we don't serve long prison terms in Minnesota, but we have among the longest uh, prob probation and parole uh, sentences if any state in the nation. So people are affected uh, directly in the criminal justice system for years. And then you add to that the limitations on housing, background checks for other kinds of uh, uh, licenses, uh, job applications, you name it, the collateral consequences of being caught up in uh, a um, cannabis arrest or a cannabis conviction are can be lifelong, and they disproportionately affect families and communities who are least able to overcome some of those barriers. So we have a real uh, mission in pursuing this bill to address those harms. Uh, and it, the, the stats that uh, you uh, cited, Congresswoman, are correct nationwide, but they're even worse in Minnesota. Uh, so the Minnesota ACLU has done similar kinds of studies and found uh, that you are 10 times more likely to be arrested if you are black than if you're white in Hennepin County or in Dakota County. And that's actually gotten worse over time, despite the fact that here, as in the rest of the nation, use rates are effectively the same between uh, African-Americans and whites. So we have a real uh, disparity issue, as you alluded to, uh, Congresswoman Omar, uh, in Minnesota that is, that is worse than the rest of the country. It is in some ways more intractable. It is no surprise, frankly, that we have experienced what we've experienced in this state in the last year because eventually this kind of injustice re leads to a response that demands justice. And so we're not going to fix it all with this bill, but we have racial equity and righting those wrongs at the very heart of the work. And when we um, reached out to House Democrats in Minnesota for their re number one, you know, what are the reasons you support legalization? The overwhelming uh, answer is racial justice. That is the number one reason Democrats have for pursuing this legislation. Uh, it is, it's no longer just about reefer madness. It's no longer just about people wanting to enjoy uh, cannabis on their own. It's really about recognizing the deliberate harms that we continue to visit on people in a way that is not, it is unjust and it is absolutely unsustainable for Minnesota. You know, cannabis prohibition is really uh, one of the single largest drivers of no knock, uh, arrest, stop and frisk, asset forfeiture. I mean, you you name it. And guess who are who's arrested as a result of this? And so it really is, you, we have to see this also in context of structural racism and uh, white supremacy, because we're dealing with all of that in this country now. And this is but one piece of 
trying to uh, address structural racism at its core. The war on drugs, we know, okay, we know the statistics, we know what has happened, but it has just messed up the lives of so many people, their children and their communities. And so I see this as, uh, especially in terms of the uh, expungement of records and in terms of the reinvestment in community programs and in job training and business opportunities, as repairing the damage because it was the United States government that perpetrated laws that wreaked this havoc on people and created uh, such disastrous uh, lives. And so we owe a debt, debt, I think, to people who have been victimized by these laws and they're mainly black and brown people. And so, um, so I see this as part of our continuation, not only of criminal justice reform, but of addressing all of the issues around structural racism. It's, it's, I, I, I think it's, it's also a really important piece to, to point out that there is this proportionality in, um, in, in the number of stops and, and arrests when it comes to uh, black youth or black people. Um, but there isn't really uh, a disproportional, there, there isn't disproportionality in usage um, among these communities. It's not like there are more black people using um, cannabis than, than white people, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. And that's what the data shows us. Yeah. But I, I'm, I'm also curious because um, it, it, you know, as, as, as Ryan just said, he, he spoke to the Democratic caucus in, in Minnesota and they overwhelmingly said, this is a, a racial justice issue. This is a social justice issue. This is why they're supporting um, legalizing cannabis. But we also know that there is an overwhelming support um, by progressives and conservatives alike, because we're seeing uh, states <laughs> that are extremely conservative um, pass to legalize um, cannabis. What? Why do you think that's that's happening? What What do you attribute that to? And um, Congresswoman, you can go first. Well, this is a money making industry, first of all. <laughs> so what can I say? <laughs> Yeah, and that, I think you saw us pass the Safe Banking Act, for example, that allows federal banking laws to uh, service cannabis-related businesses. Right now, cannabis being an industry that's legal in so many states, yet they don't have access to what legal, quote, businesses have at the federal level. And so they're denied, you know, I mean, it's a cash and carry business. And so I, I believe um, that many, if they don't see the racial justice and many haven't until recently i mean heck this is this is big time business this is an industry and uh this is something that uh, is not going to go away and i think it's a very competitive business now and i'm glad that in minnesota you're making sure that all of the equity issues are being addressed but i think i think the profit motive quite frankly is uh very uh, much a part of why we have support from others capitalism is alive you're saying <laughs> Yes. All right. What about you? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. People see an opportunity to make money, see an opportunity to raise revenue for states and want to get in the game. Um, I also think that there is a, on the libertarian side of the Republican Party, there is, I think, a genuine commitment to criminal justice reform. And they don't necessarily like the prison industrial complex or the way in which a lot these laws have been enforced. So I think there is a genuine concern on the right about uh, certain parts of the right on this uh, from kind of a libertarian standpoint. And I think it also is just a freedom issue for a lot of people. You know, in, in South Dakota, uh, uh, cannabis got almost as many votes as Donald Trump did. And so that is not, you know, and South Dakota is probably not a state super focused on racial justice issues. Although, I mean, their native community would, you know, has a long standing. Uh, uh, conversation going there. But for the most part, I think it, it is about uh, the libertarian principle the government shouldn't tell me what to do and they shouldn't lock me up for doing something that's basically harmless. You know, I'm not, you know, I wouldn't say harmless, but that's the attitude. Um, and uh, the last thing, I guess, is just uh, I think that there is a growing recognition that we've been sold a bill of goods on cannabis, reefer madness, that if you, you know, smoke a joint, the next thing you know, you're going to be addicted to heroin. I mean, 
all those scare tactics that had been used for so long. I think people now know enough people who use cannabis, who have experienced it, they've seen it happen in other states, and they realize it's just not that scary. Yeah. So, also, also, you know what? Um, I think also the medicinal marijuana movement has yeah. created an awareness also of the benefits of marijuana and cannabis. And uh, I just have to share that. Can I share this quick story? Uh, today, it's about my mother. Today is the sixth anniversary of her passing. She died today, February 16th, six years ago. My mother at 86 years old had a knee replacement. She did fine at 86. At, that was her right knee. At 89, she needed another one. And the doctor said, oh, we're not sure. You know, she had COPD. So she went out to um, the mall to have her little walker fixed. She was in perfect health except COPD, right? And she was in a lot of pain in her knee. And so this woman came up to her and, and my mother was complaining about her knee and she, and she would always text me and write me and day in and day out. She was so tech savvy at 89. And she said, um, well, this woman gave me some lotion today and I'm gonna take it home. And she told me put it on my knee, right? She didn't know what it was. She took it home and she rubbed it on her knee. What is this? <laughs> Guess what it was. So bottom line is um, I would call my mother from the floor, from wherever I was, and I would say, how's your knee? And she'd say, oh, it's drunk. <laughs> and and uh, she had no pain. I mean, my mother used this candle and that's what it was. She finally got a runner to get her her stuff. And she told me, and she made me go to the floor whenever we were debating these. She said, look, you better get down there and speak and don't talk about uh, you're going to vote for it. She said, you better bring some of your members and colleagues to vote for this because she knew the benefit and she was pain. For, her knee did not bother her after she started using this cannabis lotion. And so I think that's and, and her today, I'm thinking about her a lot. And uh, she was the one who just pushed, pushed, pushed me. Uh, and I think a lot of people, maybe as a result of the benefits of medicinal marijuana, are now becoming aware more so of why they should support uh, the legalization uh, so that more access to legal and recreational and whatever can be, uh, can uh, we'd have those opportunities, people would to have it. Yeah. So uh, we got a, a question um, from a, a constituent, and it, it it sort of reminds me of um, of of the fact that you know these measures can pass um, when they're on the ballot. Uh, that we oftentimes will see polls showing you know exorbitant amount of support <laughs> for a particular policy and then have it um, not be supported by uh, people on both sides of the aisle. Um, and so this question from um, our constituent Beth is asking if you have a strategy of trying to get it through the Minnesota Senate that is currently um, controlled by the Republicans. Yeah, we uh, have the uh, pleasure of being the only legislative body in the nation that is split between Republicans and Democrats. We used to share that distinction with Congress, but Georgia fixed that for us. So uh, we have a very progressive DFL House and a very conservative Republican Senate. And the Senate leader, Paul Gazelka, has expressed on multiple occasions his opposition to um, supporting the bill. But um, I think as we move our bill through the House, like uh, Congressman Lee's experience in the U.S. House, I think we will pick up quite a bit of Republican support. And we know that a lot of Republicans, in fact, do support the bill. So our strategy is based on demonstrating strong support from Democrats, but also showing that Republicans want to have a chance to vote on the bill and want to have an opportunity to see if we can get it passed. So. Uh, we're going to, we have never passed it in the House before. We're going to do that. And we're going to work on a strategy of putting pressure on Senate leadership to at least uh, bring the bill up and see if we can get the votes to pass it. And we have one or two little uh, legislative tricks that we can use to try to do that. 
Wonderful. And Barbara, this this question, I'll I'll pass it to you. Um, I know both of you have extensively talked about this, both in your intro and uh, and your um, answer to what the bills actually do. Uh, but it is probably someone who uh, might have joined late. They're asking, what are they going to do for people who already have been charged? People who um, already have. Uh, Legal, have faced the legal consequences. Um, what, what do these bills actually do for them? And then I also wanted um, for you to tell us a little bit uh, about this letter that you are leading uh, in Congress that I just signed on to um, that is urging uh, President Biden um, to do something about uh, this particular um, question that, that's being asked about people who have already been charged with uh, cannabis. Sure. Okay. The Moore Act, uh, in terms of someone who's been uh, unjustly charged by these um, unjust laws, it would actually uh, change the marijuana policy, facilitating the expungement. Okay, wiping records clear of low-level ma federal marijuana uh, convictions, but also uh, allows a pathway for uh, felony convictions to be um, expunged, uh, creating pathways for ownership of businesses in this space, in the cannabis space. We would also, in terms of community uh, reinvestment, there's a 5% um, tax on, on the cannabis industry to provide for community reinvestment, job creation, business opportunities, all of the equity issues as it relates to um, economic opportunities, job training, educational benefits. And also we would, uh, in the, in the uh, bill, you know, there are federal benefits now that uh, formerly incarcerated individuals, people who have uh, drug, drug charges on their record can't access uh, food stamps, SNAP benefits, um, public housing, Pell Grants. So there are many federal public benefits that are, are not accessible to those who have had um, records uh, in terms of uh, these convictions. And so I think, uh, and, and so we deschedule it also, which means that you cannot, um, the federal government can't come into your community and arrest people or shut down businesses. And when they arrest people, you know who they arrest. And, uh, <laughs> and, and so it, it really is a, a first start. It doesn't do everything, but it's a first start to repair the damage of these failed of the failed war on drugs, and your letter. Oh, you want to hear about the letter now, <laughs> De Ryan? You you know? Okay, I'll. Well, thank you for signing the letter. First of all, now let me give you just a little bit of history on this. Oh God, I was on the drafting committee for the platform, the Democratic Party platform, right? And so I had to negotiate with the Bernie and and Biden people our section on cannabis. <laughs> so bottom line is. For the most part, we got expungement, we got um, reinvestment, we got a lot in, but not enough for many of us. Uh, I want full legalization and we still haven't gotten there yet. I know uh, Vice President Harris uh, carried the MORE Act in the Senate. And so I'm optimistic that we'll be able to get there also. But in the meantime, what we're trying to do is make sure that um, President Biden comes forward and actually, and I, I just want to read a couple of uh, paragraphs from this letter. Uh, in terms of uh, issuing pardons for people, uh, hold on a minute, let me go to exactly what it says. They can uh, actually issue pardons of people and clemency. There are 1,900 individuals convicted of federal crimes. Most of these individuals have been convicted on drug charges and have not and have been sentenced so harshly uh, as it relates to today's standards. So we're asking the president to issue a general pardon to all of those formally convicted of nonviolent cannabis offenses. But in the letter, we're also asking the United States to trigger resentencing for all of those um, who remain federally incarcerated on nonviolent cannabis-only offenses for activity under uh, 
states under legal where their states uh, have legalized it. And so it would be a big deal. Now, I, I want to say also in this letter, President Carter, there's precedent. President Carter issued a blind pardon for those uh, violating the Military Selective Service Act, i.e. draft evasion. OK, so he did that or omissions committed between October 4, 64 and March 73. And so we're saying in our letter, and thank you, Congresswoman Omar, for signing it, because it's really, it's going to make a difference, I think. I mean, I'm really hopeful that they're going to, we have probably 10 signatures now, and we're building support for it. But we say that he would help us win the peace. Instead of waging the war on drugs, uh, the president could help us win the peace uh, in the war on drugs by uh, ending it and working to make whole those who have been um, harmed by these laws. Mm -hmm. Uh, th thank you for that. Um, Ryan, maybe you can take this one. Um, will the the state and um, and federal government create a distinction between uh, CPD and THC? Well, yeah, there is definitely a difference. THC is the psychoactive component of cannabis, and that will be regulated from seed to sale. There will be a, a full regulatory structure for how that is sold. The CBD, which is still, I think, not legal in Minnesota as such for sale but you can or for manufacture, but you can create in other places and then sell it in Minnesota. We, we do not change currently in our bill where hemp and where CBD would be regulated. That's still the Department of Agriculture. It would be legal, uh, but it would be treated differently than uh, THC, which is the part of cannabis that people get the most benefit from or enjoy the most. So that would be treated differently. Mm -hmm. And a Congresswoman, is that also the same? Mm -hmm. That's the same. Yeah. Yeah. We have the same bill. Uh, <laughs> yeah, very. Yeah. I mean, you guys, you, I wish ours would a little, had a little bit more of yours, what yours has. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> um, Ryan, I, I, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about, um, uh, you know, this uh, uh, this um, conversations that you've been uh, leading across the the state. Um, this this tour be heard on cannabis. Um, I'm big on on tours when I was in the state house uh, and I served as one of the assistant minority leaders. We we did the um, MPP project, the Minnesota Val uh, Values mm -hmm. Project. Um, as, as members of the Congressional Black Caucus, we, we did uh, tours um, before COVID came uh, across the country. Uh, this is how Barbara came. Uh, to visit our state and and met with constituents, they're valuable, and you learn a lot about what people yes. are dealing with, mm -hmm. um, and what drives them to support a, a, a particular piece of policy that that you are advocating for. So tell us a little bit about what you learned about your tour, and where did you go? Yeah, so we went to 15 communities across Minnesota in the fall of 2019. Uh, everywhere from, uh, you know, Bemidji and Rochester and Austin to Minneapolis and St. Paul and a bunch of suburbs. Uh, we really covered the whole state. What I found most interesting about it is how much the same messages came through everywhere that we went. The emphasis was maybe a little bit different, maybe the number of people concerned about them, but everywhere we went in Minnesota, people said that our medical program is too expensive and hard to access and people are missing out on health benefits. Uh, we saw people talking about veterans and seniors and all the benefits that they can get from using cannabis as opposed to opioids or other prescription drugs to help manage pain or long-term chronic conditions, PTSD for veterans. Uh, we heard about uh, racial justice and social justice in every single community in the state, and that looked a little bit different depending on where you were, uh, but it was basically the same kind of concern. And we heard pretty overwhelmingly that people feel like it should be their right to make these decisions and they can do so in a safe manner with good education, uh, a, a well-regulated marketplace that functions and that we're adults in Minnesota and can handle this. So that message was pretty much the same everywhere we went. I will say that people who raised concerns were also similar. They were concerned about driving under the influence. They were concerned about kids getting access and they were concerned about uh, cannabis use disorder. Um, and we took those concerns seriously and I tried to address them as best we can in the bill. So in some cases, there aren't perfect answers, um, but all legislation, all policy is a weighing of 
uh, benefits and harms, and there are always trade-offs. And it's pretty clear that what we're doing now is not keeping cannabis out of the hands of people. It is not functioning in that way at all. It is not preventing any of the harms of cannabis, and a different approach would actually serve the state much better, even if you are concerned and worried about the effect of cannabis in our community. We can still do better by having a regulated approach versus a criminal approach. Yeah. Um, and uh, Congresswoman, I, I know you you talked about um, the 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 number of people that should be pardoned retroactively. Um, I'm wondering if you know the number of people that are currently incarcerated um, who are charged uh, with um, who are facing a, a felony charge because of it. I really don't have the exact number. I'm just checking if we put that in the letter. No, we just have the the percentages, like the percentage of, of African-American uh, black people to white people who were uh, users versus being charged. But uh, we'll get that information to you. I, I don't think we put that in the letter, but I'm sure. Um, yeah, I was just so curious. Brian, do you know in Minnesota? Yeah, yeah I, don't, a, I don't know. In Minnesota, it's, we have about 80 people 80 some people currently incarcerated on cannabis only charges and of course you know what happens in a, in these situations is that people can be you know pulled over for cannabis or charged for that and then other issues arise if they're involved in an illegal marketplace so um what we're doing with our bill is your your record is automatically expunged if it was a, a misdemeanor or a gross misdemeanor and it's cannabis only that just disappears automatically by operation of law and then we create a special board to consider those felony levels on a case by case basis, but on an expedited uh, basis so that people aren't they don't have to hire a lawyer or go into court in order to get their record expunged. We create a process that's simple and streamlined for people to be able to use. And the Congresswoman Omar, let me let me just mention my staff just sent me a note. She said uh, it's a couple thousand, but uh, the sentencing project, uh, we we still don't have the exact number, mm -hmm. but uh, pro probably about two thousand. Yeah, I'm wondering, um, you said it, there's an automatic expungement. Uh, if both of you can speak to what happens if I am currently incarcerated, these pieces of legislation go into effect, what what does that mean for me? You'd be released. Okay. Yeah. And your record would be cleared. I mean, yeah. expungement in Minnesota, I think it means different things, different places. In Minnesota, expungement means that they put all the, basically, it's, they put all the records into a box, they close it and they bury it and nobody can get access to it. Yeah. And let me tell you, expungement uh, just at the state level, and this is what uh, Representative Winkler said with the MORE Act, but here in California, uh, I've held expungement conferences. I mean, this goes way back 10, 15 years on uh, not only uh, cannabis related drug offenses, but all nonviolent offenses. There's a state law, 1935, where if a person um, is on parole or probation uh, for then there's a given um, number of offenses and no one knew this, but they could go before the judge and the judge has to expunge the record. And when I stumbled on this, <laughs> I thought, come on, no one knew about it. The state did not want to invest the resources into executing and implementing this. So I had expungement conferences and the first one I had, we expected maybe a couple hundred people, 2000 black and brown people showed up on a rainy morning down at one of my community colleges, we had the state attorney general, the judges, we had clinics set up and we expunged the records of so many people that day. And finally I did this over and over again until the Family Law Institute took this on as part of their work. And so now this is institutionalized uh, in California to have uh, cases brought before a judge to have their cases expunged. And that was, it's a good, I don't know, in Minnesota uh, on just any not charge, if, but if you can expunge records, and this, like I say, a 1935 law, but it generated a heck of a lot of community support. And uh, I, on one occasion, I remember I went to one of the cubby holes and um, a woman just broke down and cried and told me she never thought that she'd be able to go free now and be able to move forward with her life. And we had expunged her record just like that. And no one knew that this was available to them. Yeah. It's been available. There are there are there are opportunities available here, and um, our expungement drives uh, usually also garner a lot of people. Just the capacity and in institutionalizing them yeah. has 
actually happen. But that's that's an inspiration, and I'm sure Ryan and I can think of of ways to expedite uh, yes. some of that. Um, I am um, interested in knowing if we get lucky um, and we are able to pass the federal bill and have it signed into law, um, do we still need the state law to also pass? We do, because uh, unless they tell us, states control their own criminal law. So, uh, and in fact, it's rare or unusual to have federal criminal laws at all. So uh, it would still be treated under the same standards in Minnesota as it always had been, even if the federal government acted. It, you know, for a lot of states, all they really need is for Congress to just delist cannabis and make it no longer a federal crime. But you're, what you're doing with the MORE Act is going well beyond that, which we should be doing. Um, and yeah. so it would help, but we'd still have to fix it here. Yeah, that's right. And that's why, uh, and I mentioned how the federal law uh, is so onerous because it's so because it's still scheduled uh, that um, the federal government can come in even when the states have already passed their laws. And I, I always say vamp on <laughs> the states, but they can go in and prosecute people because they say that they're violating federal law. So this takes away the ability for them to prosecute, and then states have their own laws that they will move can move forward with without fear of being prosecuted. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, Barbara, I think this is because you alluded to it earlier. Um, we, we have someone asking, does this have to be an all cash business due to the federal banking laws? For the most part, yeah. Uh, there's some institutions that have been set up lawfully that have figured out how to do it. Um, you know, maybe some credit unions, you know, but for the most part, uh, this is a cash cash business. Uh, and that's why I know in my community, uh, the dispensaries, it's like going into Fort Knox. You know, you go through three, four, five levels of security. I mean, it's security guards. Uh, you, you have to be vetted. I mean, just to go buy cannabis it is, a, is quite a challenge because of that. And so, um, yeah, it's it's a cash and carry business. Uh, but I think there are some financial institutions that may be established, but uh, they cost a lot of money. The cost of business is very um, expensive. So um, my last question to, to both of you um, before I, I let you give uh, closing remarks, what why would somebody who has no investment <laughs> um, in in this conversation care about the fact that their representatives and their government is spending time in um, you know in in passing legislation to legalize cannabis? Well, I guess if you don't care at all about racial justice and you don't care at all about health or access to safe products, uh, you know, I suppose you could say that we have policies that are absolute failures. We are using a criminal system to regulate a product that is much safer than alcohol and tobacco, which are safe and regulated. And I, <laughs> I guess if you don't care otherwise, you can you can uh, believe that we shouldn't be having completely irrational, harmful laws on the books. Uh, as a general matter, because we're not serving anybody's interest with what we're doing right now. Yeah, yeah, I agree with Representative Winkler. I say what affects one affects all. You got to remember now, uh, because it's uh, illegal uh, in so many places. You have illegal activity going on. Oftentimes, results in violence and gun gun violence and all kinds of uh, horrible things that happen because it is such, a, a, you know, a business that's underground. And, and so to be able to have it um, come forward as a legitimate business, uh, whether you agree or disagree, uh, the train is out of the station in most states anyway, but just know that uh, I see it as a way to increase public safety for everyone. And also it's an issue of your values. If you care about black and brown people, which I know your constituents do and people throughout Minnesota do, if you care about them uh, living a life of opportunity and, and justice, then you, you, 
may not be directly involved in it, but I, I know you care about your fellow human being and the, <laughs> human beings and you would want them to be able to live like you do. Okay, sold, 100% support. It's good to know. <laughs> um, I, I will uh, start with um, Majority Leader Ryan Winkler to, to give uh, closing remarks. Well, I would just say, first of all, thank you for hosting this conversation and giving this opportunity to for me to learn a lot and to uh, uh, share a conversation with someone who's been working on this issue and working on so many important issues for so long. It's just an honor to be here. And in the Minnesota House, we are going to start tomorrow with a committee hearing on our bill. We have a website, house.mn slash cannabis, house.mn slash cannabis, where you can get access to the bill. You can weigh in on your opinion, share ideas for how it should be changed or fixed uh, or modified. And we will be going through uh, weeks and weeks of hearings and committees on this bill. And so your opportunity to weigh in is still very much present and we welcome your ideas, your suggestions, your improvements to the bill. We really wanna make this, this issue work for Minnesota and be on top of it. And uh, together with uh, all the people who've been advocates on this issue for so long, we can get this right and move forward together. Congresswoman. Well, Congresswoman Omar, thank you so much. This has been really wonderful being with you and Representative Winkler. And Representative Winkler, I want you to know, you have uh, opened my eyes to uh, making sure that the Moore Act includes a lot of the very enlightened and progressive provisions that you have in, in your bill. And so, Congresswoman Omar, let's, let's scrub it a little bit. We got some amendments to that. <laughs> Let's we can work on that. Make it a little bit more Minnesota-like. And, and so just thank you uh, for this. Uh, it's incredible. Uh, I want to just close by saying, don't forget our veterans. You mentioned health care and our veterans. And we're working. I have my bill. The safe. It's called the Veterans Marijuana, uh, Medical Marijuana Safe Harbor Act, which allows veterans. Because, you know, our veterans, um, you know, with PTSD and all the issues that they're dealing with as a result of service to, to our country, uh, they they have several uh, many health issues, and they have found that uh, cannabis is really very helpful to them uh, for many many reasons. And so we want the uh, veterans to be able to use and to possess um, marijuana without having uh, to be uh, intimidated or charged with a crime. And so my bill, uh, and it's picked up a lot of support, would would allow for that, and would also allow. The Veterans Administration to report on their findings and what they think is taking place, and the research is so critical, which we've been able to finally get done. So I think uh, th this has many legs to it, but I think this is overall an issue of, um, you know, allowing for the American dream. There's so many people who have been shut out on so many fronts, and allowing for people to live a healthy, li healthier lives if, in fact, they have access to um, cannabis, which we know in many instances can help them um, be, you know, live, live healthier. Yeah. Well, thank you uh, both for your tremendous leadership um, on, on uh, this policy. And it's been really a great honor um, to, to have uh, this, this conversation with you all. I did also learn a lot <laughs> um, and I'm excited for the opportunity for us to fight to, to pass it in Minnesota and to pass it on, on a federal level. Um, proud to co-sponsor uh, the MORE Act last session and look forward to doing it again once you all introduce it. Um, I tell uh, Congresswoman Lee all the time, every time she says, you know, I represent the most progressive district in Congress that, wait a minute, I might actually represent the most progressive um, <laughs> district in, in Congress. And I think Ryan just proved uh, the fact that we, we might actually be more progressive. Um, oh so, <laughs> so I am just really thankful to, to both um of you for uh, being in community with us for helping answer really important questions um for our constituents who are tuned in and so grateful for everyone who is watching us um and has been part of this uh discussion on all of our platforms so I i've got to say one more thing in close yeah. congresswoman omar is the whip of our progressive caucus and so you all have to be proud of her because she whips everyone into line and so you can be certain that our progressive legislation is really getting 
a, a hearing and we're moving it to the floor and she's keeping us in uh, in order. <laughs> Learn <laughs> from the best. It is never an easy job. <laughs> she does it. Um, well, thank you all. Have a great night. Thank you for joining me. Nice being with you. Good seeing you. Thank Bye -bye. you.